Well, with us now to have a look at the papers a little bit later. We get thwarted for so many reasons by so many different people. But I'm sure you'll forgive us if it's President Obama who's to blame. Uh, Mahir Bose is here from the uh, Evening Standard and the author, Sunny Singh, has joined us too. Nice to have you here. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Let's take a look at the front pages of the morning newspapers then. The Observer welcomes the historic climate change deal in Paris, quoting the words of the French President, Francois Hollande, who described it as a major leap for mankind. The Independent shows a line of dancing polar bears celebrating the deal. The paper claims that David Cameron is to make a dramatic climb down in his negotiations with the EU this week. That story also makes the front page of The Telegraph, pointing out that the U-turn will be on the Prime Minister's central demand for welfare reform. The Mail carries an exclusive interview with Shaka Arma, the British man held at Guantanamo Bay for 14 years. The Express goes it alone, saying more than 400 miles of roadworks will be cleared just in time for the great Christmas getaway. Let's begin then, um, where you would expect, with the outcome of the talks in Paris, and we'll start with the Observer. Uh, not all of them have gone with, with climate change by, by any means, have they? Um, but here's, Sorry, Herbert. No, they haven't. And what's interesting about the Observer story is that while it says it's a major leap for mankind, I mean, obviously the story was written before um, President Obama spoke, and it says that um, temperatures, maximum rise of 1.5 degrees, it doesn't actually give any details of what was agreed. And of course, as we all know, the devil is in the details. I mean, this looks to me like an agreement to agree rather than an actual agreement which, which can be implemented or may be implemented or not. I think, I think we're being perhaps a bit, uh, too, I mean, the leaders, understandably, are, I think, a bit too anxious and a bit too, um, you know, ambitious in the claims they are making. I think, it, do you think, Sonny, that I, after, I after Copenhagen, though, well, which was such a disaster, almost yeah. anything was going to be an improvement? Well, I think there is, there is something to to celebrate, and that is the fact this was actually signed. But unfortunately, if you look at the draft that was uh, circulated earlier today, um, it is very much an agreement that is a first step. Now, let's also not forget that most of the leaders who've signed it now have to go back to their own parliaments. It has to be ratified. And it, regardless of what Obama has just said, <coughs> and full marks for pushing that through, I'm not sure if this is even going to get through the House. Um, we are going into an election year. Um, the other side has made, the Republicans have made a virtue of um, denying climate change completely. So uh, I'm quite happy that this happened. But I agree with Mihir that I think it is an agreement that is to be then taken forward, an agreement to agree. And, That's and, it. And apart from America, India, for instance, has said it will still be burning coal and so on. And India is a developing country, wants to develop. So we'll have to see exactly what India has agreed to do. China, I know, has changed tax over the last couple of years. But what will India, you know, the second most populous nation in the world. So we'll have to see, I think, exactly how it is implemented. Yes, a lot of um, praise compared to Copenhagen, as you rightly said. But nevertheless, I think, I think we should be a bit cautious. I think that's always sensible when we're talking about getting 109. Uh, USA, uh, Russia, China, Japan and India. Now we have some clarity on some of these, but we don't, for example, have complete clarity on what Russia stands, uh, has stood for and where they will stand on this, this particular agreement. Now, yes, it may be signed, but where the details will come in, we're still not sure. And I think it's, it's useful to therefore um, hold the champagne for a bit. Isn't this, though, <laughs> partly about sending a message to the markets, to investors, that we're heading away from carbon fuels and that, we're, that renewables are the, are the place to put your money? And if the markets drive that, we'll end up using renewable energy. It would be a part, you know, I think one of the big shifts from Copenhagen has been um, a, a business signal that's gone out, a signal from part of the corporate uh, private world. but we still are reliant on fossil fuels to a huge degree and unless that is addressed we like and yes the signal has gone out but I think we're taking a very very tiny step I'm not even sure if it's a step or if it's just a little shuffle forward 
But also we've got to tackle the wider question, the developing countries, what is the, role, what is the model they're aiming for? They're aiming for the model that America has got to, you know, having two cars and three but refrigerators America, but, and so on. To be fair to America and China, they've invested huge amounts of money in renewable, re renewable energy sources. Yes, but I think they have got to understand that you don't, for prosperity, you don't need three cars, you know, that sort of model. We haven't gone back from that, if you like. That is still the world model. That is what everybody wants. And therefore, if you want that, you know, where do you get that? I mean, I don't think we've discussed that enough. Well, we haven't told you yet, but we're going to get you to cycle home tonight <laughs> after the <laughs> review. <laughs> Tandem. Tandem. Oh, wow. Well, I'm looking go. forward to that. It's sunny doing the, doing the <laughs> thing with the party. I'll be at the back. <laughs> Let's uh, stay with the Observer for a second. Ex Oxford and Cambridge condemned over failure to improve state school access. Um, that they're facing a ferocious and unprecedented attack apparently from government advisors because they haven't increased the number of state school pupils studying in their colleges. I feel, Sonny, that I've read this story <laughs> a few times over the years. We have. We seem to be on, in this sort of perpetual weird world where this you know, ground on day yes. <laughs> for Oxford <laughs> Cambridge, right, where this comes up every six months. And I really wonder where it actually goes because we get, this, we get the same figures or very similar figures. We get um, very similar um, statements and then it's parked for another six months. So I'm really not quite sure where this is supposed to go. Now, having said that, I, I think there is a case to be made that um, diverse classrooms, diverse workplaces are better for the economy. And there's, there's a lot of you know, reports and studies on that. Uh, they're better for business. They are better for productivity. Having said that, how do you convince people that it should happen? And I'm not quite sure if Oxbridge is, you know, will it will happen because the government pushes it. But, but the figures are pretty, pretty damning that between 2003-04 and 2013-14, independent school pupils, pupils still make up around two-fifths no. of the intake at, at Oxford and Cambridge. So I think we can't get away from the fact that we still live in a society where if you go to a private school, you're likely to go into Oxbridge. And if you go into Oxbridge, it makes a huge difference in what happens to the rest of your life. Do you and, and still think that, that having an Oxford or Cambridge degree behind you makes a marked difference to people, even in 2015? I think so, because what it does, apart from anything else, it gives you that network. If you, you then belong to a club. And we know with jobs and things like that, if, if I'm looking for somebody, I'll think of somebody I know, you know, that, that's the way it works. It's not sort of nepotism, but it's that sort of structure of world that, it, that, 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 you know, that, that works that way. Well, it well, might be nepotism, well, look, but it might it's, not be. It's a, it's a problematic place because, I mean, we, we have our cabinet to look at just as quickly, <laughs> right? You know, that, that it does change your life in 2015 to be, you know, from that exclusive Oxbridge club. Um, but I think there are other issues that come in, and these are more problematic for Britain in the long term, where you have um, this sort of an entrenched elite that keeps replicating itself, and therefore we're not actually taking full advantage of the population and the talent that exists. I don't know what you do, though. What do you do to force colleges to change their intake methods? Well, I think that, that there's got to be a, we've got to look at our entire educational system because the gap between a good private school and a good state school, or even you know basic state school, there's still a huge gap. Isn't that down to money? The well, no, it's spent also per down child? to that we haven't really thought of how our educational system should work. And you know, you meet people who've come from not very good state education, and you think they haven't, you know, they haven't been given, they've been deprived of expressing themselves, which is unfair. Well, there is something that, 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 that's noted in the story uh, where the Commission will welcome Oxbridge's increasing use of contextual measures as a means of addressing the underrepresentation, um, but demand greater and better use of it. Now, that could be actually interesting where um, it, it does take into account um, you know, the, the, the points that we don't necessarily, the cultural capital, which is quite elusive. So the levels of confidence, the kinds of language that is used, that help, um, let's say, private school students get past certain, do certain doors. And maybe that's the way forward, if it can be used in ways to identify talent um, without necessarily marking them out for Let's it. Let's look at the telegraph. Cameron's climb down on EU benefits. We were a bit perplexed by this story because the, sort of the, the nub of it is buried about two thirds of the way down into the story. Um, the suggestion is that he's going to have David Cameron's having dinner this week on Thursday, isn't he? Um, where he's he's probably going to say, look, you know, I'm, I know I'm not going to get my 
limit of four years on people coming from other parts of the mm -hmm. EU, are, they have to wait four years to claim benefits. But and on the other hand, Mahir, they're saying actually we're going to park it in the hope that we might get it down the line. It's a bit of a confused Well, the, the story is not down. actually very well written in that sense. It, it could have been sharply, more sharply written by the Telegraph and, and, and one would have expected the Telegraph to have written it much more sharply. Essentially, over dinner, what's going to happen, it seems, he's going to say, right, as you said, um, I'm not, you know, you're not inclined to support me of the, of the, of the four-year uh, barrier to getting benefits. Therefore, right, I'm, I'm willing to give way on that and probably... Not we will, a lot of choice. <laughs> not much choice. <laughs> probably, if you think about it after the meal, if you like the sweet dish or something, we'll come back and that might take a long time and things like that. But essentially, he's giving way. There's no question about it. And what will be interesting is what happens if you're having given way on that, he comes back with an agreement. How does he justify it if he then says... You you should vote to stay in the EU. That will be a very interesting test. Well, you know, I actually would say that this is almost a non-story because this was, this was such an unlikely demand because it's linked to um, a larger issue of free movement of people. You know, it's a base of, you know, absolute fundamental basis for the EU. And so then to say, well, you know, we aren't pushing it because we didn't think it was likely, but we might come back to it. Um, it, it sort of feels that, you know, it's not really a story. It's just sort of like, you know, we're, we're trying to make it sound like this is a great U-turn. But it would only be a U-turn if there was a likelihood. But isn't he playing it both ways? He's, he's telling them, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to put this on one side. And then he's also <laughs> telling the, the British audience, the home audience, I that yet. I haven't given I haven't up, don't given worry, up I'm still there fighting for you. So he's, he's, playing, a two, uh, 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 you know, he's playing a double game here. Let's Surely. look at another story on, uh, on Jeremy Corbyn. 100,000 new members to oust Corbyn. Um, these are critics, apparently, who are going to try and flood the, uh, the party uh, with uh, members who would vote out Jeremy Corbyn at some point, Sonny. Mm. Well, they've also apparently admitted that it won't happen till 2017. So um, well, the good thing about the story is that at least they, are not they don't mention the moderates. Mm -hmm. until quite quite far into it, which I find quite a strange um, use of the term moderate, whatever that may be. But I would love to know where they're going to find these 100,000 new members um, who are going to be quite um, as involved in ousting Corbyn because it seems that there's an internal conflict and on a popular ground. Yeah, well, what you're going to see is point. Labour Party members standing at street corners, uh, giving out leaflets, saying, why don't you join the Labour Party? Free membership. Never <laughs> free mind membership. three pounds to join 50p, maybe. I'm slightly offended that I haven't been offered a free membership. Are oh, you? I'm Just sure some somebody sort. will be on the phone the moment you're out of yes. the But you studio. might be a potential leader, therefore they'll offer you a membership. <laughs> well, there it is. Let's look at the Sunday ex the Express. I'm going to leap across to the Express, if I, if I can push you in that direction. Absolutely. Um, Roadworks banished. Oh. Exclusive. <sighs> This is the lovely Caroline Wheeler, political editor, who is um, one of our paper reviewers. She's uh, reporting that there's a victory for our crusade, um, which they've been mounting, apparently, to stop the roadworks being in place in the run-up to Christmas. Well, I... Evidently, Did this, you know about this? Well, I, I've had to come through roadworks to come here today, <laughs> yeah. so I don't quite know whether, whether they'll be banished in London or some other part. Of course, you know, typical express. This is obviously the story we've all been waiting for, <laughs> roadworks to be banished before Christmas, you know, much more important than, than the Christmas dinner or things like that. But actually, it is very interesting. Before the Olympics, the talk was that all the roadworks would be done, and, you know, it would all be finished. And it's clear that we, we are in for a very, very long um, season, if you like, going into several years of road work. Obviously, much of our infrastructure producers are old and things like that, but I, I'm not sure. Road works to be banished? How are they going to do it? Try to clear them up, I think, to stop, well, the, yeah. stop the getaway being difficult. <laughs> well, it's, it's a little bit of a feel-good, hopeful story, given the fact Gatwick Express won't work. This may be the moment to take your car out. Maybe. <laughs> uh, we were also told that they are going to reduce the amount of the distance that road works were able to... Um, be carried out across, you know, there was a, going to be a limit. They weren't going to go on forever and ever to try and stop these hot spots. <laughs> uh, oh, the other story on the Express, this is the last one. Oh. Uh, Trump's cut price campaign trail. Um, again, uh, as you said, Sonny, uh, mi mixing up a, a comparison yeah. between Donald Trump and... Um, 
Hillary Clinton over how much they're spending exactly. on their campaigns. I mean, I, I found the story quite strange because there's some points that it notes, which are fair, that, you know, he's had people, about 100,000 supporters have given him donations averaging £40. Um, pounds. Um, but at the same time, we're still in the run-up to who gets to be candidates. So it, it's a very odd way of comparing his spending to that of Clinton. Um, Hillary Clinton's they're different spending. Parties. Well, they're different parties. I think Hillary Clinton's spending at this stage is not really aimed at what Trump is doing, but rather at Sanders and other, you know, internal party dynamics. This is really quite weird. I mean, I think if we were comparing and rightly so, for example, Jeb Bush, who's spent 35 million to this to date and is really trailing. That's that would be a story as to why that's happened. But at this stage, I think to compare um, candidates for nominations of two different parties is a bit odd. Yeah, you could um, almost be forgiven for thinking we were talking about the actual presidential race, <laughs> not the nomination. Yeah, but I think yes. the story here is that probably Doc. Do because Trump is making these extraordinary statements and he's getting so much publicity, A, he doesn't need to sort of, you know, throw money around. And of course, it's his own money. That's the big difference because the others have to go out and get the money. Trump is spending his own money and maybe he has thought out, and this would seem to be the case, that the more outrageous a statement he makes, the more publicity he would get. I mean, where, when the last time in a, in a primary nomination did a candidate's words affect the British political scene? I can't remember that. Where, you know, the, even Boris Johnson made a comment on Donald Trump. I can't remember an occasion where a London mayor commented on somebody who's hoping to get his party's nomination. Yeah. And, I mean, I think that there's quite a lot to be said for that. Um, and the fact that, it, you know, in fact, the, the Met police commented on it. Um, so, it, you know, it is, it is something whether we like it or not, if he's running for candidate of the Republican Party, um, you know, in some ways there's a joke that if, if you know, the U.S. president claims to be leader of the free world, the free world should have a vote on him, <laughs> um, which I can back. But I think there's a larger issue. I think at this stage he's getting an enormous amount of publicity. His statements are getting more and more outrageous. I will still hold off to see what happens to nomination because we're still quite far away. Now this does not mean he will crash and burn, but having said that, to run a presidential election, it's not enough to have a lot of airtime. It is you need an enormous infrastructure. And I'm not sure he's going to be able to pull that together. But at the moment, he is a long yeah. way ahead in the polls, isn't oh, yeah. he? And, and, to, and to think that he's getting 35% of the support, even though it is in the Republican Party, it's not the general election, does suggest that he is honing in to a sense of dissatisfaction, to a sense of anger that there is in a certain section of the American public. One hopes that doesn't extend beyond that or much more than that, but the fact that there is that sense of anger and that he can articulate it in this fashion and get all these headlines and not as you say, you know, he might eventually burn out, but at this point in time, he hasn't burned out. Everything he says makes him, it seems, more popular. Yeah, he's in our news headlines a lot, as you <laughs> just said. Yeah. That's it for the papers for this, uh, this uh, hour. It gave you a bit longer than normal, <laughs> which I know will please some. Uh, Sunny, <laughs> we're here. We'll see you again at half past 11 when we'll look at the uh, other uh, stories making the news tomorrow. The weather forecast comes next with Matt.